Welcome to Ella's Beef Easter's Radio Air Check and Classic TV Channel. This is 97.1 FM, 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 FM Talk. From Hollywood, it's the Tom Likas Show. Sean, I, I stand before you today. Uh, sorry. Somewhat confused. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. You know, uh, we spent a lot of time on our program talking about what the internet is doing to the traditional media. You've heard us talk on the air about what the internet has done to the newspaper. Apparently, two big city papers are on the verge of going out of business. The Rocky Mountain News in Denver and the Seattle Post Intelligencer, which is owned by the Hearst Corporation, been around for many, many decades. And it's currently losing $16 million a year. And honestly, uh, anybody in the newspaper business in the Pacific Northwest will tell you about the PI that the uh, biggest problem they've had is that uh, the news is freely available online and of course, over the years, as you probably know, uh, newspapers have made their share of mistakes. Many of them have, um, um, of course, cut back on local coverage, fired reporters, reduced the city rooms and what have you. Uh, print a lot of wire stories instead of local content. And by gum, the newspapers now are shocked that people don't want to read the same UPI and AP stories in the paper and pay 6 $8 a week to get it as they can get online for free and get it a day or two earlier. They're shocked. So the newspaper business has kind of been uh, screwing up and hanging themselves, essentially, by by giving away their work online. You can uh, uh, you can disagree with me on why you think they're in trouble, but uh, the circulation of newspapers has gone down dramatically. The, uh, the advertising lineage in newspapers is is at critically low levels. And um, newspapers are on the verge of becoming dodo birds. We've talked about other media as well that have uh, been done in by the Internet. And in many cases, when they've been done in by the Internet, they did themselves in. They did themselves in. Through mismanagement, short-sightedness, uh, failure to embrace technology, and what have you. And in this segment of the program, we're going to talk about the music industry. Because here is a prime example of what we're talking about. The music industry was obscenely rich at one time. I mean, do you remember uh, the money they spent? You know, the concert tours they mounted, the the cost of um, the average music video, and the the salad days of MTV. You know, back when MTV had no other programming but music videos, and the record companies were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce one video, and they were hiring these big directors. Ridley Scott produced music videos, for God's sake. Crazy. And now the uh, music industry is hurting, and it's hurting very badly. And uh, we're here to talk with our guest, uh, who is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, why he thinks that happened. The book is called Appetite for Self-Destruction. Steve Nopper, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Uh, you are a contributing editor at Rolling Stone. You've been watching this, uh, you know, kind of close up for a long time. Uh, what happened to the record industry? I mean, besides just the fact that there has been uh, a decline of the sale of CDs, the profitability of the music industry, the profitability of the concert industry, the uh, the merchandising, I mean, everything seems to have just gone down the drain. What happened? Well, first of all, my book deals with the record industry. The, the concert industry is is not doing so poorly, actually. <laughs> but well, it, it, you, it, that's only true though if you're talking about uh, fifty and sixty year olds like Madonna and Mick Jagger. Yeah, the the top levels of the concert industry are definitely doing pretty well, and the smaller levels are. You doing can shoot as well. a cannon through some of the smaller concert venues these days. I guess so. Yeah, that, newer that's, bands. Yeah, you have a point there. But uh, no, basically to answer your question, my my book deals with the repercussions of music on the internet and Napster in particular which came out in the late 90s and and enabled people to share music illegally it, it wasn't illegal at the time but but later it was it was deemed illegal um, 
to share music for free. And suddenly the record industry had to confront this idea that they were trying to sell 15 to $18 CDs at a time when millions of people around the world were just getting it all for free. And eventually they wound up trying to compete with that themselves and they wound up in a deal with Apple's iTunes store in which they sold songs for 99 cents. And, e- and that certainly was not a business model that could compete with the $15 CD either. Now, uh, when I was a child, I, I wanted to get into the radio business because of music. I wanted to, you know, I, I heard music on the radio and I wanted to go down to the radio station and expose people to music. That was my primary interest. When I got into the radio business, uh, it completely soured me on music and the music industry and the way hits are made. Let's start off with uh, the cost of a CD, which you referred to. When, when the album Meet the Beatles came out, it was a $1.99. Huh. And that was considered expensive because many albums were 99 cents. Albums. Uh, nowadays, albums are seventeen ninety nine, twenty four ninety nine. Sometimes they try to make them into double CDs and, and try to package them up with a bunch of stuff. And uh, uh, what kid is going to spend that kind of money on a on a box set? Right, right. Well, there's a bit of history to that. I mean, in the old days, before the Beatles, the only way you could buy music was on a single. So you know, you wanted your Frank Sinatra single, or you wanted your Motown single, or whatever it was, and you could buy a cheapo single. And then the Beatles sort of changed that, and the Beach Boys and the other acts of the '60s that created albums as an artistic work, as an artistic unit. And the record industry loved that because they could suddenly sell a more expensive item with a higher profit margin. And that la- that whole gravy train really lasted all the way up through the the '80s and '90s, which is sort of where my book begins when they switched over to the compact disc and uh, the cd everybody had to replace their record collection at that point with a more expensive item and and really that led to the cd boom and, and, and it made people just roll in cash it seems to me that both the movie industry and the record industry to a certain extent have followed a parallel course uh, one of the things they've both done is they both come up with these new formats the latest uh, scam, I think, in the uh, movie industry is that Blu-ray. You know, you, you've got a hundred uh, DVDs or a little collection you've been uh, putting together, and uh, you replaced all your VHS cassettes with DVDs, and then they say, "Oh no, no, wait a minute! Now there's Blu-ray. Got to go out and get it on Blu-ray." And they did that in the record industry too. You had uh, you had uh, albums, and then you had eight tracks, and then you had cassettes, and then you had CDs, and then you, then they had those digital audio tapes, and it just keeps going. Right, right. And, you know, each of those legitimately are better formats that have better quality. But but I think consumers only are willing to accept a, a complete revolution and this idea that they'll replace their whole collection, whether it's movies or records, once every 20 or 30 years or so. And so you're right that there's this oversaturation of formats, and, and I think consumers rebel at a certain point with that. I know myself with music. Um, you know, I, I, I know the romance of having uh, shelves of those big old album covers up there and what that all represented. But honestly, um, in the average home where people are strapped for space these days, uh, you're devoting more space now to your flat screen TV or whatever. Um, I use a service like Rhapsody, where just about every, not every, but uh, many of the most important albums of my collection are there. Anytime I want to listen to them in their entirety, in perfect, absolute perfect clarity. So why would I have a big collection of albums? You know, that really, I, I love the Rhapsody service, but it really annoyed me because I, I'm a lifelong music collector and I spent hours, days, weeks in record stores trying to collect all this stuff. And, and so I'm real proud of my collection like a lot of people are. And then the other day I went to a friend's house for a party and they showed me this Rhapsody thing on their Sonos system. And I just started clicking around. Why did I bother? It's all in there. Right. <laughs> And and we use it here all the time. There's many times when we're doing a radio program and, and we have a bit we're doing and we need a particular song. There was a day when you had to send the intern down to the mall, to the record store, and there'd be the warehouse or Sam Goody or something. Like that. You had to send them down to get that one particular record. You had to hope they had it in stock. Those days are over. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there the CD market will probably always exist in some form because people do like to hold something and people do like to go to the store and flip through the racks and have that kind of d- discovery experience. But yeah, th- uh, the convenience is an amazing thing as someone who probably has moved 12 times over over the past 10 or 15 years and each time having to lug my my old vinyl records and crates and my giant boxes full of CDs, I mean the the backbreaking labor that that entails. It's really nice to have a hard drive filled 
filled with music. Now, how do we get to this point? I, I remember when I first wanted to get into the radio business that you had the 45. That was, that was the primary medium. Uh, there were albums, of course, and, uh, there were big albums. Uh, I first got into the, uh, radio business, uh, in the years following Woodstock. And so that, that, uh, triple album was out there of, of Woodstock. And, uh, there were all kinds of double albums. George Harrison had a big album out back then. It was a double album. And there were a lot of other big albums out. The Beatles, of course, it had the White Album. And, uh, but but the fact is that uh, on the radio and uh, primarily for people who couldn't afford to spend ten dollars on a record album or fifteen, uh, people bought singles ninety nine cents a dollar fifty nine dollar ninety nine and you could get the most popular songs of the day. Why did they kill that? Well, yeah, you know, in my book, I have these little sections called Big Music's Big Mistakes, and one of those chapters is about killing the single. And in the late eighties. Record labels, they realize that we have this CD, it's making us tons of money. Why are we bothering to even release this little vinyl single? Why do we even need this anymore? People aren't really buying it, it costs us a lot to produce, etc. So they just sort of phased it out and it stopped being on the market. And what happened was that in the late 90s, roughly, consumers started to rebel a little bit. There, there was the only way that they could get the one song that they liked off of a certain particular record, the, the Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba, which I'm, I always use as the example, um, is that they had to go to the store and buy the $18 CD. And you, you didn't like the other 11 tracks by Chumbawamba? <laughs> that, that album is a little bit, uh, a little bit uneven, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it was a very inconvenient thing and, and people, consumers were sort of locked in this business model and in the short term it made the record industries boom, just make tons of money. But in, in, at exactly that time, sort of coincidentally, Napster came along and it, it was theft, it was copyright infringement, at least I believe it was. And, uh, and, and, it basically enabled people to cherry pick the songs and it destroyed that entire sort of we're going to put out one track with a lot of bad tracks on an $18 album business model, which was very profitable. Yeah, but it was profitable because people didn't have choices. And and by the way, and I know your book is about specifically about the record industry, but there are parallels in almost every entertainment medium right now. I mean, look at television with DVRs. Uh, there was a time when if you wanted to watch... Cheers. It was on at 9 o'clock on Channel 4, and that was it. And most people, even if they had a VCR, didn't know how to program it and didn't know how to record shows and mostly used it to rent videos from Blockbuster. And, and now I watch whatever show I want, whatever time I want, whatever week I want. I can save them, store them, categorize them, move them around. Uh, I can download them on iTunes, and uh, I can watch them on my iPod if I want to or an iPhone. I mean, uh, the, the tyranny of being told what to do, when to do, and how to do it is going away. And anybody who doesn't adapt to that as a business is going to find themselves, I think, in a stampede. And that's what's happened to the record industry. Yeah, and, and I think it's true. I'm, I'm not as much of an expert on TV and movies, but, but I think that that sort of tyranny that you're talking about is really, really good for the business people. You know, they, they can control the way the consumers do things. They don't have to be especially creative or, or high-tech tech, you know, technological thinkers to, to be able to do this stuff. And so now, what's happening now with all this choice, which is amazing for consumers and also really good for artists and the people who produce the content, the business people really have to scramble. They have to be able to have their fingers in a lot of different little businesses and be experts in a lot of different areas and be nimble and quick and go with the consumers and do all the things they're doing. It's a, it's a really a radical reinvention for these industries and it's something the record industry has not adapted well to in the past. I think they're doing better at it now, but, uh, but we'll see. We'll take a break, and we will come back. The book is called Appetite for Self-Destruction. And uh, we are talking to the author, Steve Knopper. And by the way, uh, this book uh, talks all about uh, what's happened to the record industry, how it has declined, and the decline of the single, and uh, the rise of Napster. And it uh, talks about iTunes. It talks about all of these events that have happened in the music industry that have uh, chronicled pretty much the, all the changes that have taken place. The music industry right now just ain't where it was years ago. And, and honestly, they, they don't know how to react to the Things like MySpace and uh, other ways that people are sharing music with each other, and it's driving them crazy. And, and we'll talk a bit about the age of the average uh, music company executive and w what role that plays as well as we continue. If you've got some telephone calls for our guest, now's the time. Tom Likes. 1 800 5800 Tom. Tom Likes. 1 800 5800 866. The Tom Likes Show. 97.1 FM Talk. The Tom 
Tom Likas Show. Now a shorter commercial breaks, less commercials, more of your telephone calls than ever before. That's the deal here at 1-800-5-800-DOM. Our guest is Steve Knopper. He is an editor at Rolling Stone. He's the author of Appetite for Self-Destruction. And we're talking uh, about the record industry and what's happened to it. Do you call it the record industry now? Yeah, still pretty much. I mean, they still... The record industry really refers to the major record labels, of which there are four. Just simply because there's no such thing as a record anymore. Yeah, you know, technically, they, I think it's really called the recording industry, but right. uh, most people call it the record industry. Exactly. Now, I hinted at what I want, where I want to go with this. Now, you know, one thing I picture at uh, all of the record companies are these, and uh, we can name them or not, but all of these guys who've been around forever... Um, you know, who are much older now, but they had a lot of success in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. Uh, now they are here and they see all of this upcoming technology and they, they go running from it instead of embracing it. And the result is uh, you cannot stop technology. If you try to stop it, it, it the, the movie industry found this out with the VCR. You can't stop technology. If it's coming, it's coming. You're either going to embrace it and learn how to profit from it, uh, or you're going to get driven over like a Mack truck. Isn't that what happened with the record industry? Yeah, I think it did. I think basically you had a record industry that knew how to do certain few things incredibly well. Useful things, discovering talent, turning, you know, Tony Braxton singing at a gas station into a super megastar. You know, that, that, that's an important function. Marketing things, you, you know, they were, they're, the people who worked for record labels in the 80s and 90s and before were amazing marketers, amazing publicists. You know, they had the greatest talent, but they didn't really have technolog technology people. And the ones that they did have who were very good, they didn't listen to them. You're right. They had people in charge who were sort of set in their ways, older people. Um, and, you know, frankly, these guys have $10 million a year salaries and bonuses and all this stuff, say, probably same with newspapers. They don't really have that much of an interest necessarily in, in building the new model. They, they'll just retire and take home their money and not worry about it. Remember the arguments about building uh, devices where you could dub a cassette to a cassette? I remember when I was a kid and in my early days of wanting to be a disc jockey, I wanted to put together my own cassette tapes. Uh, similar to what people now do with an iPod. I wanted to, to put my songs on a tape and then be able to listen to my songs played in the order I picked them. And uh, eventually you had to do things like tape songs off the radio and hope the disc jockey wouldn't talk over the intro of the song so you could get a clean representation of the song. Or you had to learn how to make your own patch chords and patch things together. Uh, they made it impossible to dub a song onto a cassette tape. And, and it took years for them to get that together. Well, you know, the record industry has a, a long history of being paranoid about being able to copy things. That one word, record, is is a very troubling concept to many who have worked into the in the recording. Unless industry. they're doing it, right? Exactly. And so, so yeah, the the rules were have been very strict over the years, and just why you can't do certain things you want to do. Um, cassette tapes were were always a problem. Um, you know, eventually they realized cassette tapes were not really that big of a threat because it's hard to copy those things. It's time consuming and hard. And, you know, they stamped out the digital audio tape for that very reason is it because they, the, the industry felt that that a digital audio tape would make it too easy to copy a CD and then make a copy of a copy and a copy of a copy of a copy, you know, on and on and on. And and that would lead to international piracy and inter international boot bootlegging, which was a big problem and still is a big problem. But the fact is that that paranoia explains the way that they acted when Napster and MP3s popped up, and and that just made what I'm discussing on on a, a irreversible international scale, and that scared the the heck out of everybody. Let's go to your calls here for our guest, Steve Knopper. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number of the book, Appetite for Self-Destruction. Robbie on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, Steve. Hey, Tom. Hey. Hey. How are you guys doing? Great. I just wanted to say, you know, the record industry, they're making those CDs so freaking expensive. You know, you know, if it was about five bucks, I think kids would go in and pick up a CD for, you know, if it was cheap like that. But now, you know, you go and they're 18 bucks, 20 bucks. No one wants to pay that much. And, you know, even then you can go to like places like Amiibo or Amazon and get them used for way, way cheaper. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, the the I think that the record industry could stand to think about the concept of let's lower our prices, build up the volume, make consumers happy, and and that's something that they've just not been really willing to do over the years. But others have taken on, taken on that function for them. I mean, Walmart and Best Buy and so forth ha- have have deep discounted prices on a lot of a lot of titles sort of against the resistance of the record industry and you're absolutely right I, I just did a story for rolling stone about how you go into the amazon mp3 store these days and there are just some eye-popping deals on there i, I saw elvis costello my aim is true for a dollar 98 for the whole album in mp3 form last week you know and and good deals like that and so it seems like slowly gradually dipping a little toe in the water every day uh, they're they're getting a little bit smarter about that didn't the record companies back in the 60s or 70s uh, fix prices prices so that when you went to a department store you know an album was a particular price and that was that and uh, there were uh, there was no way i know in new york state i think the attorney general got involved because uh, the, uh, there were certain collusion between record companies to keep prices at a certain minimum level you know that actually is a little bit before my time that i studied in the book so i'm not familiar with that particular price fixing scandal but i do talk about a little bit later when um when when record industries sort of went in the direction of the big box stores and they started doing a lot more business in the 80s and 90s with Best Buy and Walmart, um, Best Buy and Walmart wanted to lower the prices to get people into the stores so people would buy refrigerators and stuff. The record industry didn't like that, so they, they created this thing where if you raise the price of the record um, beyond a certain level, you would get benefits, free advertising uh, f- from the record label. And so that was supposedly was going to help the Tower Records and, and the mom and pop record stores of the world to, to stay in business and stay competitive. But that was price fixing. You can't, you can't be an industry and dictate how, how, what the minimum price is. We talked about this on the air a few times, and I'm sure you've got uh, some mixed feelings about this. Uh, uh, not too long ago, the, the, the big Tower record store on the Sunset Strip went out of business uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, they, this was covered by every TV station in town, and people were being asked how they felt about Tower Records going away. And the responses were almost unanimous. People said, oh, that, it is such a tragedy. That is so terrible to see Tower Records going away. And the reporter would say, how often do you shop here? Oh, I've been here in about 10, 15 years. I buy my albums on the Internet. But it is really sad. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really sad. Um, you know, I, I was a big Tower Records fan, and I continued buying records there all the way to the bitter end. I went to those sales. It, it was pretty awesome there for a few weeks in, in 2006, and, and I've been to that Hollywood store. And it's sad. You know, I, I'm a person who grew up collecting records, and, and that experience. I, I tell the story sometimes. Last year, my wife and I had our anniversary in Vegas, and we went to a mall on the Strip. And uh, my wife went off shopping, and I was just wandering around, and I noticed in every store overhead, they were playing, playing pretty cool music. But I could not find a CD store ev- anywhere. So I realized that if I wanted to actually buy that music that I was listening to, you know, and I would have done it had I, you know, in the hour that I, w- I was standing around, I would have spent 50 bucks at a, at a CD store. I actually would have had to go back to my hotel room, fire up my laptop, and order those CDs on Amazon, and then go home and wait for them to be delivered at home. So the, the whole, or, or just download them. And, and, you know, the whole thing is, is perverse. I, I, I do think people still want to buy, buy records, and I think it's a shame that these stores have closed, but man, the business passed it by. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. Our guest, Steve Knopper, the book, Appetite for Self-Destruction. More of your telephone calls are coming up. Tom like it. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. The Tom Likas Show. This is 97.1 FM, 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 FM Talk. Like a show. Now you hear us six days a week. Saturdays, every Saturday, 2 until 6 p.m. Every Saturday, 2 until 6 p.m. And Monday through Friday from 3 until 8 p.m. as you head home on 97.1 FM Talk. Blowmeuptom.com if you can't hear us on the radio. You can't get away from us. Our guest, Steve Knopper, his book, Appetite for Self-Destruction, published by Free Press. And your telephone calls, Chris, on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Dad. Son. How you doing, bud? I'm doing great. 
great to hear from you, Tom. Hey, uh, just uh, real quick, want to thank you for uh, all the financial advice you've given me over the past year, man. I've really gotten my finances together just from all the advice I've heard you uh, be giving out to a lot of different people. So uh, much uh, appreciation for that. But Excellent. Well, hey, uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, and Steve, what's up to you there? Hey, um, thanks for calling. Hey, uh, well, what I wanted to say was, uh, how is the record industry going to address the, the bit torrent issue that's been going on a lot lately? I mean, um, I've been doing uh, the downloading of music since Napster came around since uh, back in, like, the late 90s, and it seems like every time they shut it down, there's a new creative way that they're just getting uh, getting music out there and people are not paying for it. How is the, the music industry going to going to address this problem because it seems like an unstoppable problem. Yeah, absolutely. And that's sort of the problem that's at the heart of my book. I mean, you know, the the industry did sue Napster and won and it sued LimeWire and Kazaa and Grokster and all these other file serv- file sharing services and also won. They got some Supreme Court decisions that declared these services were copyright infr- infringement and and therefore illegal. And then they shifted in 2003 to suing the the people who actually did it. So, I mean, I think they just realized that it was just fruitless to keep suing every individual service, especially since a lot of them moved offshore. And BitTorrent in particular is really almost impossible to find because, uh, you know, that you're actually not sharing a, a file. You're sharing little bits of a file and they're, and they're coming together, you know, w- to make a song once it, once it hits your computer. And, and, um, so, so it's kind of impossible. It's sort of like trying to, uh, to catch water or something, you know, and, uh, and, and, so they sued the customers and and they sued like 35,000 people and that wasn't working. This file sharing wasn't stopping and they finally had to stop these lawsuits just a few weeks ago. And so now what they're doing is they're actually trying to compete with that model. And and they're just saying it's inevitable. People are just going to pirate music. We tried to stop it, we couldn't. And now they're just trying to figure out sort of a new business model about how they can do that. And and one of the ways that may be the blueprint for the future is sort of what Radiohead did a couple years ago when when they said, we're going to put our whole album online and pay for it whatever you want. If you think it should be free, get it for free. If you think it should be 20 bucks or 100 bucks or a million bucks, then pay that. And had they made no money on that, although they did make money, it would have been still a great promotion for selling the CD package that they put out later and selling tickets for their concert tour later. So the recorded music is sort of becoming this kind of loss leader, even if it's not necessarily a loss for people to buy more expensive items later. And that's, I, I sort of think that's kind of um, coalescing into, into what may be the future business model for the industry. For several years, the Grammy Awards show, which many of our listeners watch every year, uh, it, it had that one creepy, awkward segment where the president of the recording industry, whatever they call that thing, RIAA? That's, uh, the Recording Academy the is recording what actually runs the Grammy. Academy, yeah. It's complicated. This guy would come out there and essentially like a schoolmarm start, uh, you know, like wagging his finger about people stealing music in the middle of the Grammy Awards. Was that an effective way of uh, talking to the customer? Yes and no. Um, there, there did need to be some education. Um, I think that five years ago, ten years ago, people legitimately did not know that when they downloaded the LimeWire software or the or the Grokster or Kazaa software, that this was illegal because you know some mom who's busy or dad who has has a teenager who's doing all this stuff takes a quick glance at the Kazaa software and it says. Do you accept these terms and conditions? Yes, no. Okay. Well, it must be legitimate. You know, I mean, people just didn't know. And so there, there was this educational campaign that, that ran for years and years. And supposedly the lawsuits were part of that. Although I, I say in the book, I believe that that went a little bit too far. It was a little bit too punitive. But yes, I do think that the Grammy Awards thing was very heavy handed. And you're right. It sort of took away from the tone of the whole broadcast. That was unfortunate. Hello. Uh, hello, customers. You're a bunch of thieves. Yeah. That, Stop stealing. Yeah. And, and you know, in, in my book, I do not defend copyright infringement. I do believe that theft and stealing music online and piracy is a bad thing. And it did threaten the labels unfairly. So, I, I you know, I'm not letting copyright infringers off the hook. But 
my criticism of the industry is that they should have taken the next step much sooner than they did and realized that here was a lot of opportunity. Here was the path that you're talking about. You have to change the business model. You have to go into the direction that technology is taking you. And, and that's really your future. And no one saw that. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Nicholas is listening to our show. Speaking of technology, he's listening on his iPhone in Seattle on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on, Tom. Sure. Tom calling. And uh, Steve, you kind of answered my question when you were talking to Chris, um, but I was going to ask you a little bit to follow up a little bit more on free albums, like the Nine Inch Nails, the Slip album that came out. Right. And uh, I was actually, um, when I got that album off their website for free, I did donate. I donated 10 bucks. That's probably how much it would have cost had it come out anyway. And I was actually kind of impressed by how they did that. So I was like, you know, I may go see them in concert because this is kind of cool that they're giving it out for free, you know. And um, how does that business work, giving out a free album? How do they make money off of that? Yeah, well, that's a good question. It, it, you're right. I did sort of address this before, but just to add to that, um, you know, what they're doing, is, first of all, they can make music. They can make money off of that. Bands like Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead um, yeah. have, have devoted followings, have devoted fan bases who love the music and think what they're doing technologically and business-wise is cool. And so people like you, Nicholas, are, are willing to, to um, give a donation, to basically give money for that cause because you want to support an artist. But the people who are sort of left out of that and this is a big problem for this industry, are the record companies. Because the record company's entire business model, at least up until very, very recently, involved the selling of one product, which was recorded music. And so that industry has traditionally been the very powerful middleman between the artist and the fan. And so in, in, the, in, the, in the Nine Inch Nails and the Radiohead scenarios... No record company can really make money off of that. That hinges on those acts owning their own masters and not having a contract with the record companies and being flexible enough to give that music or sell that music and then say, you know, Nicholas, you're, you're my fan. Now that you've bought this music, I'm going to blast you with some emails that tell you when my next concert is or where, I, where you can buy a T-shirt or, or a hat or a vinyl record or... You know, come to our concert and buy some popcorn, or 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 see the sponsors' ads. You know that kind of thing. And that, what, man? I mean, I think that the the average Joe like myself listening to the Nine Inch Nails on my iPod, I don't care about the, the record company. I mean, if if they're releasing it on online and they're saying, you know what, man, whatever you can give on the donation, that's cool. I respect that a lot more than saying, you know. Oh, we're going to put it out in Walmart, and that's the only place you can buy it. Yeah, you know well, what you, yep. but by, by the way, wasn't there a time, though, when the record company provided something of great value to the artist, recording facilities, yes. producers, uh, stuff you can now do in your basement with software and, and a, a PC or a Mac? You can do a lot of that stuff yourself now. Yeah, for decades, the, the record industry model is exactly what you just described, Tom, which was that uh, all this stuff, making a record, going into a studio, um, making a video, as you said at the beginning, that's all incredibly expensive. And, and you and I in our basements in 1987, we couldn't afford to do any of that stuff. We needed help. We absolutely couldn't do it. We needed a record label. And so that's why record labels so, were so all-powerful is that they controlled that access. But of course, in recent years, there's been Pro Tools, you know, the, the kind of studio software that's accessible to everybody. You can make your own records in your, in your bedroom. Um, you can. You want to make a video? I can buy an HD camera at right. Costco. Right, exactly. Or there's, there's the famous OK Go example, this Chicago rock band that on the very cheap made a, made a video of themselves doing this goofy choreography on a treadmill. And, um, and, and somehow this thing caught on and they, they got millions of hits on YouTube. And the next thing you know, people are calling all over the world to, to book them to play concerts in their countries. And, uh, and then they were on MTV VMA awards. So this was sort of their, their end, end run around the industry, even though they were signed to a major label at the time and really never sold any records because of this. We'll take a break. I thank you for the call. Our guest, Steve Knopper, his book, Appetite for Self-Destruction. It's published by Free Press. We're talking about the pending demise of the record industry. Tom Likas. 1-800-5800-TOM. The Tom Likas Show. This is 97.1 FM, 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 FM Talk. Hollywood.
on this Tom Likas show at 1 800 5 800 Tom. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. Here is six days a week now. The Tom Likas Saturday show, 2 until 6 p.m. every Saturday. Every Saturday, 2 to 6 p.m. And Monday through Friday, 3 to 8 p.m. as you head home on 97.1 FM Talk. And if you can't hear us on the radio, you can always get us at blowmeuptom.com. Steve Knopper is with us. His book is called Appetite for Self-Destruction. What did the record industry do to itself? That's what we're talking about here. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Samantha on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, guys. How you doing? Great. Good, thanks. Hey, um, question. I was and always have been and still am a fan of Prince. And I don't quite know what happened to him, but it seems like he's always had like kind of a love-hate relationship with the recording industry. And like the previous caller mentioned about Nine Inch Nails, how that was really cool, how they pretty much gave their album out for free and just took on donations. Whereas, I think Prince, I, I was wondering if you knew anything, like you can barely get any of his stuff on iTunes. And I don't know, something, do you know anything about this? Just a little bit. I mean, um... You're right. Uh, the history that you're talking about is that the, back in the early 90s, Prince protested the record industry and said that he, you know, he, he painted slave on his cheek to show that he, he had given up all, all his recordings to the industry and had to do what they wanted. And then when the internet came along, he was out front of it. He, he was, that's what I think you're referring to is that he, he's a, an incredibly prolific artist, as you know, and puts out tons of singles and songs. And, um, he was, he was an early person who, who went on the internet and sold songs on, online. And, and sort of was outside the record industry sort of threatening them, um, right. threatening their model, and, and was very progressive. But an odd thing's happened recently, and, and I haven't followed all the details, but um, he, he still doesn't have a, f a, a long-term deal with any record label, but whenever he puts out a record, he, he's been doing like a one-album deal with a major label for the distribution. And just recently... I've noticed that he's kind of done a, a bit of a 180, and he's a little bit more protective of his content. Perhaps yeah. that's why you don't see it on iTunes as much, although I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And and he's just, he, he's sort of gone in the other direction right now. I, I don't think that he's sort of in that, you know, Metallica kind of, we're going to lock it up and nobody can get it, and, and we're going to keep offline kind of mode. He's just sort of following his own step and, and will continue doing it in a baffling way for, for everybody, I'm sure. Yeah, no, good word. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Thanks Samantha, for the question. thank you for the call. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. This is James on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, what's going on, Tom? Not much. Hey, um, I have about 350 songs on my MP3 player, which most of them I download directly from the CD. And then uh, about 15 of those songs I downloaded from the Internet. Now, those 15 songs I downloaded from the Internet are clearly not as loud or crisp as the CD that I directly downloaded from. Has Is there some format that I'm not getting or something, or is that just a normal thing? I talk to my friends, and they say they don't hear any difference, but I'll listen to their MP3 play. I can hear the difference, and then I'll show them, and they agree with me. James, when, uh, where did you download those songs from? Was it iTunes or some service, or was it P2P? I got them from iTunes, and I tried Rhapsody as well. Oh, okay. All right, so so the, I'm not totally sure what type of format you downloaded them. Um, you know, there's a big debate about sound quality that's out there. The MP3, which is the, the most common file that people download online, is an audio compression. So what, what happens is that whenever you rip a song from a CD onto your computer, that song gets compressed. And and the the computer, the, the software, takes certain pieces out of the music, certain digital bits. So it's not as full and rich sounding as as it was on a CD or, or certainly as it was on, on a vinyl LP. So unfortunately, the standard, and this gets a lot of criticism, um, Bob Dylan has sort of stood up and, and ripped on the entire industry for going in this direction. Neil Young and, and others have said this, that this is, that what you're talking about is, is a very big problem for, for sound quality. Yeah. Um, but what's, what's happening now is that's being changed. Um, the iTunes store is starting to sell downloads in a higher quality format. Unfortunately, you have to pay a little more. I believe it's $1.29 to get to get a slightly higher sound quality format. Um, and, and there's lossless 
formats, which means they don't lose that kind of sound that I'm talking about. Those take up more space on your hard drive. They're usually a little more expensive. They're, they're often longer to download. But I do believe that there is a movement that's out there saying, you know, MP3s are kind of terrible, tinny, little sound. And, and I think that's changing. And ultimately, I, I think you'll be able to, to get back up there. But now I, I happen to disagree. I happen to think that the average person, the average person doesn't notice the difference. Very much like in the days of videotape when everybody said that Betamax was clearly the better format for videotaping. Uh, but the average person was more interested in having fast forward uh, uh, scanning of the tapes, uh, the ability to tape two hours instead of one hour. Uh, so people chose uh, what they call good enough technology. It was good enough. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're you're sacrificing something to get that convenience. For that's one answer, and and the other answer is, um, you know, when I listen to S Sister Ray by the Velvet Underground or the Sex Pistols, you know, which is some of my favorite music of all time, I don't necessarily, I'm not so much of an audiophile that I have to have the most pristine quality. Of course, many records you do want that kind of sound quality. So you know, I don't mean to be naive about that, but but I'm with you. I'm I'm not like the caller. I'm not I'm not so concerned about the the most pristine sound quality that I can. It also works both ways because uh, I have found on some older recordings uh, when they take it off tape uh, and it goes to uh, uh, a digital format of some kind, uh, it actually highlights the flaws that you may not have noticed before uh, when they were on vinyl or uh, when they were uh, on tape and you had to press the Dolby button and eliminate some of that hissing. I have heard uh, digital tracks that have audible hissing on them and it, it actually sounds worse, not better. Yeah, you know, I, I we're getting into some engineering questions here that are beyond my pay grade, but um but you know, it's interesting. I, I have a chapter in my book about the adoption of the C D and when the C D first came out it got a lot of criticism because the sound was too good. Digital recording was too good. I think there was a uh, a Keith Jarrett jazz album that came out around that time and you could actually hear in the background like the air conditioning running and furniture being moved around and stuff that it, that the, the old studios could never pick up and and artists were mortified by this it, it sort of reminds me of, of HD TV when all the announcers suddenly you, you can see their, their zits on their face and stuff like that <laughs> you know too much of a good thing I guess I guess to Steve Knopper from Rolling Stone his book is Appetite for Self-Destruction published by Free Press Devin on the Tom Likas show hello Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, sorry if I uh, get off topic. I just tuned in. But I guess what I'm hearing, too, is to me, looking at record labels is kind of like looking at a bank. And in the past, we're talking about artists that have established followings, whether it's Nine Inch Nails or Prince or ACDC. They can do these out there things because people will always listen and care. Whereas a new artist, even today, to break a new artist costs millions and millions of dollars and how oversaturated everything is with every different outlet and to do that the biggest artists i feel become brands it's not even about the music which is kind of sad but it, it's true it's kind of you know you're branding somebody and the music is a part of it and then you have the fragrance and the clothing line and so i'm with a lot of the hollywood records artists uh, with on disney that have tv shows so it needs to still exist on some level where who's going to pay for all of this because we can have the people in their basement recording albums, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good and there's going to be a direction. Well, uh, there's certainly some truth in what you say, but we are out of time. Steve, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. The book is Appetite for Self-Destruction. It's published by Free Press. Steve Nopper. Our email address, tom at blowmeuptom.com. The Tom Likas Show. This is 97.1 FM, 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 FM Talk. Adam Carolla, Ross Danny and Frank, Danny Bonaducci, Tom Likas, and more. Get complete shows now at 971FMTalk.com.